Ah, yes, the booster pack. The most common vehicle to get those precious, precious cards into the hands of the little tykes who want them most. The excitement in their eyes as they behold your cardboard-based luxury product. But the little boys and girls will turn up their noses if your booster packs are anemic or bloated. Thankfully, through the power of math and science, we can teach you how to build a better booster. But first, a word from our sponsor. Monsters are among us, stalking the forests and highways of this great nation. Defend yourself with the power of MetaZoo, the trading card game where you can tame these fearsome creatures. But be careful, as your very surroundings can have an effect on how your plans might carry out. You must stay on top of your game to stay alive. MetaZoo, Cryptid Nation, wide release coming July 30th. Get more information at metazoogames.com. Hello and welcome to Errata Text, the follow-up to the seven deadly sins where we look at different aspects of game design. Odds are you all know what a booster pack is, a small packet containing a random selection of cards and standardized ratios usually from as low as 5 to as many as 15 cards in each pack. Booster packs weren't always a thing though. Originally, trading cards were included with some sort of treat, such as chewing gum or chocolate. Places like Japan still have these sorts of products, such as the Shinra Bancho cards I have here. It was later that the cards themselves became the highlight product, eventually shedding the candy entirely, swapping the wax packs for the more familiar plastic foil. Booster packs are nice in that they are inexpensive and highly versatile as a product, appealing both to casual fans who buy one or two packs a week when they go grocery shopping, or the heavy collectors who buy them by the box to acquire them in bulk. There is also the middle ground, special product bundles that contain a selection of packs along with some premium items at a slight markup, as well as being an easy way to spice up a starter deck. They are the base currency of a trading card game, the most common way people interact with the product. The thing most filmed on YouTube. Now of course there will be those people out there who try to say that booster packs are just like the loot boxes found in video games, and I'm just gonna get it out of the way here, no. <laughs> No, they're not, and anybody who tries to say otherwise probably has a loot box to sell you. A loot box, or gotcha mechanic, is a system in a video game where some of the contents of that game are locked behind randomized drops that people pay real money to acquire. They're called gotcha mechanics after the sound an egg capsule machine makes as you turn the crank, and they work largely the same way. However, unlike booster packs, not everything contained in them have any value. Unlike with trading card games, which have things like power cost balancing and incomparable features, higher rarity gotcha prizes tend to just have bigger numbers to overcome arbitrary difficulty spikes meant to push more spending. Some games also have infamously low rates of dropping anything useful to try to encourage players to press the spend button over and over again, using a tangled web of alternative currencies to conceal just how much they're actually spending. There is no way to exchange these items on any sort of secondary market, with some games even immediately eliminating duplicate items, and if the game ever gets shut down, anything you paid for goes with it. No way to archive your collection or play it again later. On top of that, in the case of things like EA Sports' Ultimate Team, where a new game is released annually and you must begin your collection again, it's like it has a hard annual set rotation with no carryover. Any trading card game that ran itself like that would be laughed out of the room, and I honestly have no idea how Ultimate Team sustains itself without exploiting the worst parts of human volition. Trading cards, on the other hand, are permanent. They are all game pieces that can be used in perpetuity no matter what happens in the future. Even if publisher's support for a game ends, you can still play with the cards. In trading card games, that pressure to spend only exists at the highest levels of competitive play. Things like casual or draft play mean people can have fun with a more subpar card collection, and alternative formats such as Penny and Popper encourage people to use lower tier cards for deck building. There's also the secondary market. Even if some cards you get in packs aren't worth anything to you, they might be worth something to someone else. If you pull an extra copy of a really cool card, the game's publisher doesn't run into the room, rip the card to pieces, and hand you a popsicle akin to how gacha games do it. Instead, through the basic systems of the secondary market, you can get those cards to the people who really want them. Same for the opposite. Have a card you really want but don't want to drop money on booster packs? Just fire up the secondary market to buy or trade for it. Also, booster packs are somehow... cheaper? 
A 10 card booster pack from Pokemon costs $4, whereas a 10 part pull from video game Genshin Impact, which is roughly the same thing, costs nearly $30. I feel like we've gotten off track here. Wasn't this supposed to be a video about making better booster packs through math and science? Yeah! Math! And science! Okay, so I keep talking about math and how it can create a better booster, but what does that actually mean? Well, I think I've actually found a sort of golden ratio on what size to make your booster packs. That number is 5% of your set size, rounded up, plus one. Again, this is more a trend I've noticed than a hard rule. I have more numbers coming later, and that doesn't mean to adjust your pack size between sets, just set it to a base level, which might be even less if your premier set size is unusually large. The biggest thing this pack size does, from what I can tell, is prevent the problems of both box chaff and box anemia. Like I said, I'll talk about these proportions in a minute, hold tight. So, for example, a typical Magic the Gathering set is 280 cards. 5% of that is 14, plus 1 is 15. An average Pokémon set is 180 cards. 5% of that is 9, plus 1 is 10. A typical Yu-Gi-Oh set is just 100 cards, so 5% of that is 5, plus 1 is... 9? Okay, there are definitely factors that can affect this golden mean, but let's take a look at these Yu-Gi-Oh numbers and break down where there might be a problem. So, for an example, let's look at the Yu-Gi-Oh set Phantom Rage. Since the start of 2020, a Yu-Gi-Oh booster pack contains 9 cards, 8 commons with 1 foil rare or better. Phantom Rage has 50 common cards in the set and a deck cap of 3 copies of each card, meaning a full set of every common totals up to 150 actual cards. Now, a booster pack of Phantom Rage contains 24 booster packs, and with 8 commons per pack times 24, that gets us... Oh dear. That's 42 cards a player will never need. In fact, that's nearly an extra copy of every common card in the set. This is Box Chaff. Box Chaff are the cards inside a booster box that a player will never need. And I don't mean like, eh, this card is trash, I'm never gonna need it. I mean cards at a quantity above that which are allowed in a deck. Any given player only ever needs one complete playset of any card. Even if they build multiple decks, most players are happy to shuffle a few cards around when they get ready to play, with only those who want to play the decks they make against each other needing more. So here's where the conundrum shows up. While a player has gotten more copies of every common than they will ever need, they have maybe one copy of half of the set's rare cards. If a player wants to get more of the rare cards by buying a second box, they literally need none of the common cards in any of the packs inside that box. Everything that isn't the rare card is literal garbage as far as they're concerned. And if they want to trade for rares, none of these common cards in the booster box are viable trade options because everybody else who bought one box has the same glut of commons. These things have the side effect of making common Yu-Gi-Oh cards, even the good ones, effectively worthless. You might as well light the commons from your second box on fire for all it matters, or do what I do and leave them out for the kids at the local game store. Preferably not on fire, but you get my point. Now, I'm usually the type to say that you should maybe buy a box of the cards before you invest in singles, but in the case of Yu-Gi-Oh, I understand why people might skip the box experience. Although, weren't we just talking about how there are other factors that can affect pack size? Let's say, for example, your sets average 80 cards. 5% of that is 4, plus 1 is 5, so 5 card packs, right? Now, what happens if somebody asks you why your packs contain only 5 cards, yet cost the same as Magic Boosters, which contain 15? Your answer would be, of course, to avoid having too much chaff after opening a box. Now, for people who are hardcore gamers and collectors who tend to buy by the box, they'll be a minimal here explanation. They crack boxes and would hate to have a lot of waste. To a casual player, though? The kind of guy who maybe buys a pack a week and might not even be aware of the fact that you can even buy cards by the box, this just makes you come off as a cheapskate. This is, I think, the main reason Yu-Gi-Oh packs are larger in the United States, to give people who only buy cards occasionally that sense of value. Yu-Gi-Oh has a pretty big casual market after all. There's also the factor of draft play, and having larger packs so people can have more cards to draft with also has its merits. 
The opposite problem is box anemia, where packs and boxes are so poorly proportioned to the set that it is basically impossible to make a viable deck, even a bad deck, from a single booster box. Many things can cause box anemia, such as unmixable attributes or packs that are too small for the set sizes, though in these cases it can be caused by a core set that is double sized to accommodate enough options for each attribute as the game tries to get off the ground. It's something to keep in mind when launching a game, where limiting the playable attributes or having a robust assortment of starter decks can help prevent this. So what's the solution? What kind of pack can appeal both to casual and invested players? Well, for a pretty good answer to that question, we need to look no further than the Digimon card game. I'm gonna be honest here, the Digimon card game version 1.0 booster box is quite possibly a masterclass in excellent booster design. Digimon 1.0 has a set size of 187 normal cards. 5% of that, rounded up, is 10. While this would prescribe a booster size of 11 through the numbers I gave before, they have it one card higher at 12 cards per pack because they have given their packs a second rare slot. Ah, not a bad time to bring this up. There is one constant in all of booster pack design, and that is... The rare slot is sacred! You can see what is considered a rare card in more detail in my video on the subject, but it doesn't take long before people are opening booster packs exclusively for them. It should go without saying that one rare per pack is industry standard, and nothing, and I mean nothing, should interfere with that rare slot. A foil version of a common card is no replacement for an actual rare, and in fact could cost somebody to throw a conniption. I mean, could you imagine what would happen if one of these people opening Yu-Gi-Oh packs, already drowning in commons, found a common card where the rare should be? The hero card slot should not interfere with the rare slot. The foil card slot should not interfere with the rare slot. The only thing that can interfere with the rare slot is the even more rare slot. If I ever make a 10 commandments of trading card games, which I am never going to do, the first one would be, thou shalt not interfere with the rare slot. In fact, some games have recently experimented with giving their packs a second rare slot, where one of the slots is a rare no matter what, and the other slot has a chance of being a higher rarity. I'd say this is one of several alternative slots that fall outside the bounds of normal rarity slots, which I will talk about later. But back to Digimon and time for some more math. <clears throat> Digimon 1.0 has 187 cards, not counting alt foils, 69 commons, 50 uncommons, 45 rares, 20 super rares, and 3 secret rares with a playset cap of 4. Each booster box contains 24 cards, which each contain 7 commons, 3 uncommons, 1 rare, and 1 rare or higher, with odds of higher being slightly better than 1 in 3, of which a typical box also contains 1 secret rare and 1 alternative art card, which has a chance of also being a secret rare. Multiplying all of those by 24 gets us this. So let's break this down. In this case, we get slightly more than two copies of every common card, giving us half a playset or better of everything, but no full playsets of anything. We get one and a half copies of every uncommon card, meaning at least one of each and half again at two each, along with one copy of roughly two thirds of the regular rares, barring the occasional doubling as seen in my box, and one third of the higher rarities. Now, this changes a lot compared to our Yu-Gi-Oh box from before. Now, while you don't have any full playsets, that's not as big an issue as you might think. You get enough cards to build at least a presentable deck, and whatever you get from the box, you can fill out with your other options. What if you wanted to buy a second box? Well, at that point, you would finally get some overflow in the form of a few commons. However, do note how it took two boxes of Digimon to generate about as much box chap as one box of Yu-Gi-Oh! A second box would fill out your commons, nearly fill out your uncommons, and get you another 48 rare slots to play with, with very little waste. There is also, of course, the secondary market. Say you want to buy just one box. Well, then you can collaborate with other people who did the same thing and exchange for the cards you need through trading or through buying singles. When trading, it can even be possible to offer cards of lower rarity on top of other cards to gain leverage for a stickier trade. And these sorts of trades are worth it because now every card has value. Not including full play sets of everything encourages players to swap between themselves. Because, you know, it's a trading card game. So yeah, this is certainly not a bad goal to try to proportion your sets and boosters for print and box form similar to this. As long as it's possible to cobble together something playable from the contents of one box, you should be fine. The playset completing rates for commons and uncommons can also be a bit better for games that support draft play. 
The double rares approach to the packs are also rewarding to casual players who get double the bang for their buck in some already decently sized packs. And now with those observations on booster box contents out of the way, let's take a look at pack contents. The rare slot is sacred! <clears throat> Usually, a pack's contents include a rare, thrice as many uncommons as rares, and twice as many commons as uncommons. In a pack of 10, we get a classic 1-3-6 configuration. There are also things like 1-2-3 for smaller packs, or 1-3-11 for packs like Magic, though packs like Magic also tend to have some additional components such as lands, tokens, and avatars. These are the alternative slots, portions of the pack replacing or in addition to the normal rarity slots, the rare slot is sacred, which exists for special types of cards in the packs. The most common of these is the resource slot. If a game has a resource card system, it's not a bad idea to include one of them in each pack in its own dedicated slot. These are commonly put in the back, and this is because due to the popularity of unboxing videos, most games put their rare cards in the back, and a resource slot card acts as a bit of protection for that rare card. Another common alternative slot is the foil slot, which is not to take the place of the rare slot, the rare slot is sacred. The foil slot is where parallel foil cards go, more on those in the previous video, but other games also use it as the place to include rarity beyond rare cards when those cards use foil, as foil cards are heavier and can be detected by those loathsome scoundrels, the packwares! As long as the rate of actual foil cards is pretty good, nobody will complain that they got another rare in their pack. Pokemon has this sophisticated system where they have code cards of different weights to conceal when extra foil cards are added, but that technology might be a bit out of reach for most games. Another common slot is the hero card slot. A lot of games have hero or avatar cards meant to represent the player. Ideally, these come one per pack in their own slot, decoupled from the rarity of the rest of the pack, the rare slot is sacred. I made a video in the past about a game where they didn't decouple this and recycled the heroes from the first set in the later sets, meaning that about a third of all packs didn't contain a rare card from that set. So again, the rare slot is sacred. Nobody will complain about getting an additional rare in the pack. Hero cards, or other cards you want to have one of in every pack, such as Flesh and Blood's equipment cards, should work like my example from the parallel foil spot, where the rarities of the hero cards are the same ratio as a normal booster pack's contents. So, to use our 136 example, in a run of 10 packs you'd get one rare hero, three uncommon heroes, and six common heroes. And finally, we have the token slot. This is where we get cards that don't contribute to gameplay, or at the very least don't get shuffled into the deck, and also generally aren't included in the count when mentioning the number of cards in a pack. These can be literal tokens, such as those created by card effects, or other things like checklists, code cards, draft tokens, mini ads, or art cards. They are also often used as backers for the rare card if nothing else is available. It is not at all uncommon for a game to use several of these additional slots. Pokemon uses three, so rather than one, three, six, it's more like one, three, four, one, one, plus one. Now, while I can't really go into details on how to get your game to print, this video is long enough as it is, there is something about that that I need to bring up, and that is how the cards inside the booster packs are randomized. You'd think this is an automatic thing, right? Where the cards inside represent a randomly assorted shuffle from each rarity? Well, no, actually. If you've watched any of my box opening videos, you would see that I have encountered the occasional game that took this for granted and wound up having their cards packed sequentially. This is like rather than getting cards 37, 52, and 85, I instead got cards 37, 38, and 39. This causes a whole host of problems, mainly in how it causes packs to contain all of the same type of card, which can be frustrating for players who are trying to either get a wide variety of cards, or who are expecting one or two cards of the type they are actually looking for to appear. Also, it feels gross. Queen Elephant, more biomass. What? Well! <laughs> I'd hate to be the guy who opened this pack, said the man who did in fact open that pack. It's the same with packs containing duplicate cards. It actually happens a lot in several games from 1995 that I've gotten the chance to open, but it also feels super gross. Only forgiven if the duplicate comes from the foil slot, because technically it's not quite the same card. 
Now, when it comes to randomizing cards, this shuffling or collating is usually done with a combination of machines, but also on the printing sheets themselves, rearranging the cards of each rarity so the cards going into those slots are already randomized. Fancy printers like Cardamundi offer this service themselves, but if you're printing on the cheap, like out of China or something because you're not a multi-million dollar company and kinda have no choice, you might want to randomize those sheets yourself, or at the very least make sure it gets brought up with the printing service you plan to use, as, like I said, it's something you apparently need to ask for. Sorry to drag you into this again, Beast Clans. And when it comes to how many packs to include in a booster box, common totals are usually multiples of 12, such as 24 or 36. But a neat idea to keep in mind, most booster boxes are two packs wide by one pack deep, with larger boosters going for one by threes. Tray styles used to be a thing, but they've mostly been phased out as the narrower box profiles take up list shelving real estate, which is better for stores. The thing is, if one of those stacks measures at least 180 cards tall, then the box can store the cards inside on edge in a temporary fashion like a regular card box. It's another one of those little things I like to point out. Most printers have set box sizes already, so it pays to follow their lead. Just have a good idea of which pack scaling gets you the rarity spread you want. Specially printed alternative art or foil box topper cards are a common incentive to add to booster boxes as well, but see my rarity video for some advice on how to handle those. The box itself is usually stylish, bearing some important artwork or iconic characters and clearly stating what is inside. Bare minimum how many packs, how many cards in each. Many games even include rarity breakdowns and odds on their boxes as well. It's best to stick to that sort of information on here, so it's not really a big priority to include your game's lore, or your chili recipe. I... really have no words for this. In another cute twist, in Flesh and Blood, every booster box contains the same set of 24 draft tokens, so setting your token spread to match up with the number of packs in your box is also a stylish choice. Speaking of stylish, some folks get fancy with it, like how Force of Will includes a hard box or how Legend of the Five Rings used tins in their waning years, but those really only matter to gamers with a taste for quality production who buy by the box and might not be worth the added costs. Another common booster box configuration is what I call the Half Box, an industry standard set by Magic's Fat Pack and Pokemon's Elite Trainer Box. These are usually the priciest goods sold in non-tabletop gaming stores and contain less than half a booster box's worth of packs, usually 10, but they also tend to get packed with a big load of supplies, such as premium counters, card sleeves, promo cards, and basic resources, with the box itself often being a storage container. Using different numbers of booster packs as an upselling method is far from uncommon. There used to be a heavy presence of these things called collector's tins, with a set of boosters and a special card contained in a metal tin that, allegedly, acted as card storage. These have been largely phased out in favor of cardboard gift sets, which is good. Tins were terrible for actually storing cards in. Frankly, I'm just waiting for more games to just load up a standard 500 size with their half box goods, similar to the Spoils basic box of awesome. But in general, people tend to be okay with reasonably priced product that contains a few packs and some sort of premium item or card as, and I've mentioned this before using a staple Pokemon card as an example, people are willing to pay a bit more for a guarantee. A bit less common is games experimenting with pack size. Games like Yu-Gi-Oh! have special premium sets where they put out a smaller set with fewer cards per pack, but the contents of those packs are always foil. Flesh and Blood did something similar with the constructed only set Crucible of War but by far taking the cake is Magic the Gathering. It's time for another good idea, bad idea. Good idea. Selling a 35 card pack for $7. Bad idea. Selling a 15 card pack for $25. The end. The traditional 15 card pack from Magic the Gathering is now specifically called a draft booster for draft play. A couple of years ago, they introduced the Theme Booster, a 35 card pack that contains only cards of a specific type, color, or guild. I like these, as they are more cost effective than regular boosters and let players accumulate only the sorts of cards they are interested in. Far more divisive, however, is the Collector Booster. A draft booster sized pack sold for more than six times the price on the basis of containing more rare and foil cards. Most have found that they hardly ever merit the additional cost, outside of the Godzilla foils from Ikoria, and they are not really an effective way of obtaining cards. 
Oh, of course you would show up now. Not to mention, their small size likely makes them a shoplifting item of choice. I mean, I already pointed out how a premium pack can be done, but a markup this huge is bound to raise eyebrows. But even more weird is the set booster. These are 12 card packs sold for a bit of a markup that contain a higher concentration of more rare cards, but I'm again split on these. Most of the set boosters I've gotten tend to be loaded with uncommons instead of commons, which is certainly a better value than a draft booster, but I will admit that it does stray a bit too far into the territory of being kinda loot boxy by having the number of rares in a pack be highly volatile. Somewhere between 1 and 6, this kinda uses the exact mechanics you'd see in a lot of loot boxes where you get high rolls and low rolls, and I can't say I'm a fan. Okay, so yeah, a booster pack can be kinda loot boxy when it's designed to be loot boxy on purpose, but the set booster is definitely an anomaly and not the rule. I mean, if you want to mess with the number of rares in a pack, why not go all or nothing? An occasional feature found in some card games is the Rush Pack, though Force of Will players know it more as the God Pack where once in a blue moon, somebody finds a booster pack where every card in the booster pack has been replaced by cards meant for the rare or higher slot. I guess God Pack is an appropriate name, seeing as... I personally call them Rush Packs because they contain a huge rush of rare cards and give you a huge rush when you open them. Unlike the set boosters, which advertise having a possible huge number of rares, Rush Packs are more generally accepted because they are rare and intended to be a pleasant surprise rather than a gotcha incentive. Casual players like them because of the occasional huge score, serious players like them because they can spike the rares in their box, collectors like them because they don't contain anything not obtainable otherwise, and draft players maybe aren't as excited because now they have to share their burst of luck with the rest of the class. If you're gonna introduce these, maybe avoid advertising them so people can be pleasantly surprised when they encounter them. The idea to make them once per box can be tempting because any box buyer would love a guaranteed rush pack per box, but if you've ever run a game store, you'd know that once the pack with the top rarity card gets pulled, the other folks at the store will demand the store open another box before they will buy any, leaving a big trail of half-empty booster boxes in their wake. It's why so many games have dropped a lot of their once-per-box sort of items, instead opting for a twice-per-box setup, like Digimon's guaranteed alt-art card potentially being a secret rare. So maybe a rush pack should be either less than once-per-box or slightly better than once-per-box to have some boxes that occasionally have two. I do some more direct analysis on booster packs and boxes in some of my videos in the Docs Game Club playlist, which I'll add at the end, though apparently some people find them boring because I, you know, actually talk about the cards in the packs rather than just flashing straight to the money cards. But if you're one of those sorts of people, what are you even doing here? I hope this video has been helpful, encouraging you to think more on your own about your booster pack and box construction rather than just copying how the big boys do it. I mean, who knows, maybe your game would do well copying how Magic or Pokemon does their booster packs, but it might just as likely be that you'll find more success with something in between. Keep these things in mind and you too can build a better booster. Join us next time on Erratatext.